Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And rounding off our first Philippines week, we have another fantastic historian for you. Tony Ferredo is an expert on the defences and fortifications. Will talk to us about Corregidor and Manila Bay. And it is, in fact, our last World War II TV show for about 12 days because I'm taking a break, going and doing some stuff. But we come back with some more naval battles. But because we're doing this at a different time of day, we've got a lot of different viewers. If you're in the Philippines watching this or somewhere else in Asia, welcome aboard. All the information you always need is in the description below, and we would welcome you considering becoming a patron or a channel member. But I'm going to bring Tony in now. Good evening, Tony. How are you today? Good evening or good afternoon on your end. You know, everything's okay here. I mean, a little bit rainy outside, but uh, yeah, it's, it's doable. <laughs> we're we're so managing. Okay. Great. So we'll, we'll start with the question of, you know, how did you get interested in World War II? You know, did you grow up right beside defenses and, heart, and or was it something you read through books or films? Where did your journey begin? All right. It, it, it's a mixed bag, actually. First of all, I've got two uncles who fought in Bataan. All right. So hearing their stories, you know, uh, when I was a kid, actually it just mesmerized me. And then my father was actually more of a big uh, ETO, or European Theater of Operations fan, actually bought, bought a lot of books. So it kind of interested me well, but nothing really stuck, uh, just like what was happening in the Philippines, especially in the early part of the war, because I, I would be reading books later on, but, you know, MacArthur came back, I shall return, the Battle of Lady Gulf. But the, the first Philippine campaign was very fascinating to me because of the myriad of, you know, weapons that they were using mm. in their gear. I mean, I was like, Fascinated, but I said, why, why are there British soldiers in the Philippines early part of the world? Because of, they were all wearing their Kelly helmets. And, and, I, and I figured out later on, oh, oh, that's the reason why. It's because whatever the Americans fought during the First World War, they brought it, you know, in the Philippines. You know? and, and after that, and very quickly, and one thing that really got me hooked was that my first travel to the island of Negros, where my mother came from. So I was running through the the sugarcane fields because the, the family business on their side was um, uh, sugarcane planters and i was running near near the field and there it was you know a crashed japanese plane mm. so uh, up to this day i still get goosebumps i go like oh my god i mean and, and I, I found out later after reading it was a japanese gay for the oscar so other than coast artillery i'm i'm also like uh, dwelling into the air war and things like that mm. i mean and and yeah and, and of course you know as later on as um uh, as I go back, I kept on reading books, and that really got me hooked. And I also been scale models, just like Albert. Yeah, we can tell that by the boxes behind you. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, my and, office slash hadron. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, and the second question is, I asked, I asked Ronnie, I asked Albert, is in your day to day life, is the is the World War Two big to people you know there in the Philippines, or is it kind of being forgotten now? It's eighty years in the past. Well, it's also a mix. At first, you know, when I was growing up, when all the elders or like World War II vets were, you know, were fading away, World War II kind of took a back seat. Okay. And it actually, our generation, you know, or the likes of me, Albert, Dr. Jose, actually are, and, you know, Desiree or Phil War, we're actually starting to repromote uh, uh, World War II. And uh, at first, you know, so, so, and you have to have to get it to social media as well. And, it's both a double-edged sword in where you can disseminate information at the same time fight off uh, all the disinformation about World War II, especially yeah. in the Philippines. All right, and and uh, right now we're all hooked, uh, and we're dedicated to actually proliferate the history of uh, and uh, World War II in the Philippines. Yeah. Well Brilliant. And that's why we've got people from, from the country on ourselves. So you've got a PowerPoint with lots of photos. So we're going to sit back, folks, and listen to Tony talk about Corregidor on the Harbour Defences. Fire away with your questions. We'll do them as we go along. Lots of visual treats in store for you. And um, I can't wait to get started. So over to you, Tony. All right. Thank you, guys. OK. And uh, first of all, good afternoon, good evening or good morning to whatever part of your world is. My name's Tony. And I'm here to talk about Corregidor and the harbor defenses of Manila Bay. I mean, because of history, I mean, a, a lot of a lot of focus has been on Corregidor. Uh, you know, the Bataan campaign, the Corregidor campaign, you know, it, it goes hand in hand. But little do they know is that other than Corregidor, there are other islands as well who played a major part, you know, during the uh, during the defense in the Philippines in 41 and 42. So, you know, um, to start off with, I mean, I'm showing you a map area of Manila Bay. So the bay area is actually 30 miles at its widest point, but in its entrance to its nearest point is actually 12 miles. And within those 12 miles, you'd see four small islands, the biggest one being Corregidor. Now, these, these islands 
actually act as gatekeepers and guardians. And on the top of it, you have the Bataan Peninsula, and to the south, you have the Cavite mainland. So it actually, the four islands there constitutes as like a, a gatekeeper or you know a barrier for for any uh, ships that enter Manila Bay. Okay. So I'll start off first with uh, I mean the usual I mean the, the usual suspect, which is Corregidor Island. So a lot of you would be familiar with the shape now. The orientation of this is on the right would be the east and on the left would be the west. Now on the western side you'd have the tadpole head because it's shaped like a tadpole. So this is where actually where topside for most of the big gun batteries would be stationed is. And half of the tadpole to your right would be middle side where actually a lot of the barracks and living quarters and you know some, some facilities uh, were, were actually built. And then as you move to the middle you would have the dock area which is actually part of bottom side and bottom side actually constitutes all the way to the tail to the right okay so that's for you with you in a snapshot it's about three and a half miles wide uh 1.2 miles at its widest point okay it's about two miles just off the two and a half miles off the coast of pataan and another nine miles forward to Cavite mainland so despite its closeness to pataan for is actually part of the Cavite mainland so even people at, at this age right now gets confused like you know it's just a stone's throw away from Bataan and why is it uh, you know Corridor part of the uh, Cavite Mena. So just to give you a snapshot um, these are the gun batteries that are actually located in the island Corridor. So we have the four western large disappearing gun batteries right and these are armed with two each of them had two 12 inch 1895 guns on you know uh, 1901 disappearing carriages. Now, of the four, only one had the 10-inch battery, which is battery grubs, because grubs actually covers mostly on the northern side, while the big, the big brutes, I call them the big brutes, they actually cover the western to the southern side, which actually opens up to the bay. So it's an ideal spot if any of the ships entering Manila Bay, you know, these guns will actually fire those areas. And then you have the two large seacoast mortar batteries that, uh, you know, that, uh, that have an all-around fire. You have battery way armed with the older 1890 mortars and battery theory in two pits that had actually a mix. All right, you have pit A with uh, same uh, same mortars as, as way with the model 1890s and the more modern 1908 mortars on pit B. And then you have the Smith Brothers. Okay, these are this is actually the one two punch of Corridor Island. Okay, it's battery Smith number one and number two. Both are armed with same gun as. What the disappearing guns, same barrel, same tube, but however they're mounted on a barbed carriage. And this allows them to elevate up uh, to 35 degrees. So they're actually more long range than the usual uh, disappearing guns. Okay? And uh, Battery Smith number two was later renamed as Battery Hearn around October of 1937. So you have Smith and Hearn. And then you have the protections for the minefield, searchlights, and the land defense protection batteries like. You've got two six-inch batteries of Rams and Morrison. You've got, and then you have three-inch batteries of James, Hannah Cushing, and Maxwell. You know, I'll be showing some pictures of them in a while. And then during wartime, there was an eight-inch railway uh, gun battery that was uh, installed, you know, uh, in, in the island. And the reason for being, and you'll be thinking, why did we have these eight-inch railways? It was actually part of the inland sea defense projects before the war. So what they wanted was because the Philippines is an archipelago, so you have a lot of inland waters, you know, going in and out. So it was decided to why don't we arm this in case of any invasion, we can hit, you know, you know ships that would pass by. So they wanted to have like the 12-inch gun similar to uh, Hearn and Smith, but it was so expensive. But back in the U.S., they had like, oh, we had a surplus of about seven guns we can ship to the Philippines. And they were shipped. Uh, as well, but only two were mounted. One was mounted in Bataan and the other one was mounted in Corregidor. So, I have here with me an aerial photo of Topside, which actually shows 95% of all the gun batteries or all the seacoast fixed concrete batteries in Corregidor. Right? So, if you look to the right, you see Battery Crockett, Erie, Wheeler, and Cheney, and these are big 12-inch you know, uh, caliber guns. And then you have the Smith Brothers in the middle toward the bottom. You'd see those circular mounts. So Hearn and Smith, okay. And then you have the other batteries as Grubbs and Mo Battery Morrison and James after the protected northern channel. So 
So that's top side. And then here's the photo of both middle side and a portion of top side. You know, like I said earlier, middle side constitutes a lot of the living quarters and the barracks. Although at top side, you'd have the famous Mai Long as well. And I'll explain why, why the, the, the name Mai Long got into it. But you would see there in your lower right, you'd have the middle side barracks and the officer's quarters just actually call it. And I would like to point your attention on the three million gallon water reservoirs. Right. Right. So one was at middle side, one was at top side. Now these two reservoirs would play a major role during siege. Okay, because at that time, you know, during the the battles in Bataan and Torrejedor, it was summertime. Yeah. And water became a little bit scarce. Okay. Although the island has, you know, has 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 wells, has natural wells, but they dry up easily. So that's why the water reservoirs, you know, are. And then recreational facilities like the YMCA and things like that. And then we go further down, which is actually an area called the bottom side. And this is actually where a lot of the docks were located. Now, the northern docks is actually controlled by the army. So you have the North Mine Wharf and the Engineer Wharves, okay? And then you have Lorca Dock. Lorca Dock became famous because as General Arthur left in that area on March 11 of yeah. 1942. He didn't want to leave in, in the South Dock, which was Navy. So, you know, map being map, you know, he always had to play. Now, just before you get to the South Mine Wharf, that's actually a place called Barrio San Jose, meaning a small community. And this is where actually were a lot of the civilians uh, who were actually dependents and who were working in the island pre-war were all militant. Okay? And Corregidor uh, actually has five more barrios, but San Jose being the biggest. And then on the left, you'd see Malinta Hill. I'll talk more on that later on and talk about the tunnel. But here on the upper right, you'll see the old Spanish board, and you'll be wondering why is there a big structure called the stockade area? All right, the stockade area is actually a prison stockade, and the reason being is because they use prison labor for the construction of all right. structures in 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 the in Corregidor in all the other islands. I mean, it's free labor. I mean, it, it also decongests the jails in Manila. Send them to Corregidor; they just get fed, and they're all on the guard. Prisoners love it here because, oh my God, so windy, so open. We're in an island, we get fed well, and uh, get, they got paid a little. Right. So, I mean, just to round out some of the structure, you got the top side of a mile long barracks. It's technic technically called an artillery barracks. Right? So, top side would actually have the 59 post artillery, that's where they would be built. In. And then, and the world mile is just a pet name, or it's just, I mean, it's yeah. just, you know, it, they just point. But I, I talked to one vet saying, no, it's actually a mile because it, it's actually one third of a mile. But if you count all the three floors, you add it up, it becomes a mile. So that's oh, yeah, three, three times the third, yeah. yeah. But it's actually a third of a mile. And then you've got the middle side barracks, which is actually the same as length as the mile long, but it is divided into two phases, I mean, into two structures. And then you have the Fort Mills Hospital. Okay, so, you know, during this time, a lot of there were not a lot of sickness there, but you know, at least they had a base hospital. So, and, and you know, to round out the, I mean, the structures, you would have the cinema. There are like actually two cinemas in Corregidor, and you've got the water tanks at the back. Now, interesting to note was that uh, for sanitation, they use salt water. So they usually have a salt water tank and a fresh water tank, and, you know. And then, of course, you've got the officers' quarters and stuff, the lighthouse and all the other facilities. Now. The, and the reason being is because if, when you look at Torrejidor, it doesn't look like a fort. It's more of like an outpost, and sometimes it's uh, being compared to like a, a mini city back in the U.S. Because the best mode of transport around the island is to trolley, I mean electric trolleys. And uh, there are about close to about 14 miles of trolley, I mean, on a three and a half mile island that goes around. So as you can see, you know, civilians and military alike and can, can ride on the trolleys, however, only... Military guys can go to, let's say, uh, installations such as gun batteries and, you know, or, 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 or the off-duties and spots, spots. And then we go now to the next island, which is Carabao Island. Now, Carabao Island is about uh, half a mile uh, in length and, let's say, uh, 0.1 of a mile in its widest point. Okay, now this island is actually closer to the Cavite mainland. It's about, at its nearest point, it's less than half a mile away. So. Despite the small island, you know, uh, it was armed. 
And the interesting thing you note is that it was armed with two 1907 14-inch guns in disappearing carriages. Now, interesting to note was that when the 14-inch guns were produced, the first four, num numbers two and four, went straight to the Philippines. So meaning that the Americans already had an interest to defend Manila Bay by, you know, by sending priorities, by sending all those guns over here. And then they armed it with eight 12-inch uh, uh, sequels more. Okay? And plus, you know, so this is a snapshot or an error snap uh, 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 shot of Carabao Island. As you can see, to your left will be the Cavite mainland. And just about half a mile away. Now, the Cavite mainland, the hills that you see on your left, will play a major part because the Japanese guns would actually be, be, be demounted there so they could lay fire to the harbor defenses of Manila Bay. And, you know, and I will talk about that in detail later on. And then you have Fort Hughes, which is Caballo Island, uh, the nearest island to Corridor, the second largest one. It's about 0.8 of a mile in length and another like uh, 0.5 of a mile in width. So again, I mean, despite the small islands, you'll be noticing that they were armed with 40-inch disappearing guns. Mm. Okay, and uh, the mortar batteries that they had there, which is the 1912 Seacoast mortar, are actually 50% longer than the barrels of the ones installed at Frank and in Corregidor. Of course, they had the 6-inch battery and uh, as well as a 3-inch battery in Cuba. Now, this is an aerial snapshot. I love these aerial photos because it shows the details of the defenses of the island, right? So, I mean, you won't see any, you know, like the recreational facilities. Everything is done to Corregidor, but only like barracks and, you know, uh, spaces for the men uh, there. So, but if you look closer, you know, you would see some of the major batteries in there. And uh, you would see battery would drop one of the 14-inch uh, guns uh, mounted below. And then you had two mortar pits, A and B. Now, another thing you have to note on, on the right top is cable winch. Now, what does the cable winch do? So in order to transport supplies, everything must to really have a cable winch that actually drags the, the, the flatbed cars and whatever supplies to the two mortar batteries on top. So the engineers actually here made a you know made a fantastic job, you know, making sure that the defenses would be, you know, uh, well supplied and in its uh, efficient order. And of course, you know, the famous Fort Trump, which is El Faile Island, okay, it's the smallest of the bunch. It was actually a rock. So before it became its battle-like structure or shape, it was just actually a rock jumping out of the sea. So what they did here was on the top, you have the photo in 1909, which showed actually the, the former uh, Spanish battery, Battery Letro. Okay, and it was one of the batteries that fired towards uh, uh, Admiral Dewey when he entered, you know, uh, the Bay during uh, his attack on the Spanish Armada. So later on, the island was chipped off, and then the structure was placed on top. And later on, it became, you know, it, its famous size. I mean, its famous shape. You know, it does look like a battleship when the waves actually push through. It's stationary, but it's unsinkable. All right. Mm. So it was armed with, uh, you know, uh, dual uh, turrets in uh, housing two 14-inch uh, 1909 guns, and and the guns that actually were made here was built specifically just for Fort Trump. And on its side, you had uh, two six-inch batteries, you know, one on top of one of the other, and an anti-aircraft gun battery, you know, for a defense. So what you will see here is the two turrets. You have Battery Wilson, which is the top turret, and Battery Marshall, which is the bottom turret. Now, interesting to note that you'd see two squares, those two squares that you see on the flooring on the on top thing. They're actually oil pans, and the oil pans are actually, is actually to catch, you know, oil dripping out from the barrels of this 40-inch, you know, during maintenance and, you know, uh, for cleaning. And then you have a view of the 6-inch batteries on the side. So since we call it uh, it's like, a, like a concrete battleship, so you will have a port battery and a starboard battery. And on your right will be the 1917 3-inch anti-aircraft gun, so two of them move out. And then you have the and then you have the minefield. This is one of the least talked about things on, on and you would see about uh, the northern section and the southern section actually covers the entire entrance of Manila Bay. So you would see here that 
it was Navy, but in reality, there were actually Army mines that the, na that the Army turned over to the Navy for, okay. you know, uh, for clarity. Because uh, I, I have to tell the audience here that Coast Artillery is part of the U.S. Army. It's never with the Navy. So all the guns that you will see in the pictures were all Army guns. They were never Navy. Okay. And some of the myths after the Sony Corridor, they're saying, oh, you know, those are naval guns. No, no, they're all Army guns. And as time went by, uh, I mean, more defenses came in augmentation. Now, this is the famous 1917 or 1918 uh, French copy of the GPF, the 155 GPF. Now, if it's 1917, it's French made. If it's 1918, it's the US made uh, gun. You know, they're, they're similar, but only with, with a few differences as far as the breach and some of the. Uh, so, and, and you would see that uh, uh, Albert and Dr. Rico also talk about this gun because they were actually And a sample of the 3 inch uh, anti aircraft guns, you got the older 1970 top and the mobile 1918 guns. But the, 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 the better 3 inch AA gun is the M3, mounted on an M2 Spider mount. And this is actually a picture when they just arrived in Corregidor, you know, just in time. To be deployed in, in some of the anti uh, and they will play a major role. And of course, you know, the, another 48 of those uh, 1917 75 mm guns. Now, these are actually copies of the British 18 pounder, right? So the Americans took an interest in it, copied it. And then when World War One came out, when the American Expeditionary Force was going to France, they say that, oh, uh, the, the French were saying to them, oh, just to chamber your guns to 75 millimeter and we'll supply you the ammunition. And that's the reason why a lot of the U.S. arms, you know, in the early part of the Philippines actually coincided with the French because they had, you know, uh, 155 and 75 were actually standard calibers of, of the French for, for the artillery. Do, do you mind doing a, a few questions before we move on, Tony? Because a few have built in. So if my first one is, just for me, is the influence of design. Uh, is are they looking at places like Singapore? Are they looking at what was happening at the American Civil War or the First World War, or, or are, is the design being done by people based in the Philippines from the area who are looking at the the geography first? Is it how does it work? It's like this: when when, when the Americans occupied the Philippines just after the, uh, the Spanish American War, they actually they actually researched with Manila Bay and you know seeing that it, it's a potential harbor, you know, it's a new colony in the east. Okay, so we got to arm it. They don't want to commit the same mistakes as what the Spaniards did, you know, during right. the battle. So, so a lot of these were surveyed on spot. And, you know, you, you have a bunch of army engineers that actually get on sending reports back to, to the War Department. And depending on budget and, you know, uh, and of course, you know, with a little bit of uh, help from the Congress, that's why the, the designs of, of the harbor defenses were actually uh, done on site. And as per recommendation by the army engineers here in the Philippines. Okay, so, thanks. So let me talk very quickly about the battery. I mean, because Corridor has a series of batteries. Now, the of course you have the disappearing guns, okay? And the concept of the disappearing gun is actually has it would load. You will be have it in its loading position, the one on the right. The shell cart would be in line with it, the breech, and then the gun would be tripped to hover on top of the parapet. Parapet will be the concrete structure that you see there on the left. Now, what actually moves the gun is the counterweight. So the counterweight should be the same weight as the gun. So the gun usually, and this one would be 115,000 pounds. So a typical, you know, a, a 12 inch uh, dual battery would be something like this. So you have the guns on top, you've got the loading platform in gray, the green area is in parapet. And then on the cutaway, you underneath you would have the magazine. The magazine would constitute the, the, the charges, the powder charges, and the shells. Okay. The battery also has its own generator, although most of the batteries rely on post power. But in case the post power gets cut, they would have their own power to, you know, uh, to run the battery. And another thing you need to note is that Corregidor has a number of concrete magazines. And, and, and the reason being is because the Philippines is so far from the U.S., free supply of ammunition in case of war would be difficult. So yep. they actually built, you know, these concrete magazines to stop fire 
more ammunition than a standard uh, gun battery. So, you know, in case they run out, they would actually, you know, uh, just go to this magazine. And ammunition is actually transported by rail. So here is a flatbed showing 12-inch uh, sequels mortar shells that is being transported to battery theory. As you can see at the back, uh, this is actually the uh, the leftmost uh, traverse magazine. Um, they would actually stop by uh, shells, you know. And the other thing that uh, the batteries had was a spare tube or spare barrel. And reason being is because, like for the hit, for the big guns, they will only have a shell a barrel life of 150 rounds. After that, they will have to be relined and sent back to the U.S. And that's like another eight to ten thousand miles. So it would be more logical to send a spare barrel in each battery. So in case one gun is one gun needs a replacement, they can actually do it by themselves. And this is actually a series of photos that shows a firing sequence of a 12-inch gun. Up the photo shows the rammers and the 12-inch shell on the shell part being, you know, pushed inside. Photo on the top right shows actually the, the that portion where the 12 inch shell and the cart would be in level with the breech, and then the powder charge will be will be set on. Usually it's 320 pounds, but in the Philippines they only use about 270 pounds of propellant charges. Right. The shell would weigh about a thousand pounds, and then the photo at the bottom right shows the gun actually on its firing mode. The gun there was is actually on its way down. So the recoil of the gun actually kicks the gun back to its loading uh, position. And then you have the long range sequels guns. Okay, and uh, like what I said, these are actually 12 inch guns. The barrels are similar to what you see in the disappearing guns, except they're mounted on a barbed carriage. And this allows them to fire at 35 degrees and uh, attain a maximum range of 30,000 yards or about 27 kilometers or 17 miles. Or Wow. Now, what you see on top of the 12 inch gun is a sub caliber 75 millimeter gun. And the reason why it's mounted there is because, in order to save the wear and tear of the barrel, they would actually do daughter practices. And then the crew would load like a dummy shell in the main gun, but would actually fire the 75 you know, uh, millimeter gun on top. And they would just extrapolate you know, the way the shell into the way. The That's really fascinating, Tony. But go back one to that slide there because it reminds me of a show I did about Normandy with Michael Ackerman about the 88 millimeter guns on Omaha having an MG 34 barrel on top of the yeah. barrel there to use for training and for sighting. But th you know, that's obviously a smaller level. This is a, the same, t the same idea, but on a much larger caliber. It's fan And, and people, but by the way, people are absolutely loving the photos. They're loving the information. People are saying I've saved the best show of the, uh, to the last. So it's just fantastic stuff. We're, 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 we're gripped. Yeah, okay, anyway, the, the gun you see on top is a US made 1916 75 millimeter gun. Okay, so and then it fired, you know, the standard 75 millimeter shell, which was actually used in the entire siege. And it, 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 you know, the same part of the gun. Now, the firing sequence here is as you see, first of all, the shell is being run on the top bed, and then you you would see the long bad charge. All right, so that would be that would be around 270 pounds of propellant charge. The gun is actually elevated on the uh, lower left photo, and then on the lower right, boom, firing. So what is interesting to note there was that even when the gun is firing, there will be four guys underneath the gun. We're actually traversing the traverse wheels. Okay, so imagine the, the long time experience. And then, of course, you have the turret-mounted guns. You know, this is a live fire exercise at Fort Drum. You would see when the when the this is a two gun salvo by battery mounts. You would see in front of the water. You see the ripples caused by the you know by the blast. So you see how powerful these guns are. Although they're only limited to 15 degrees and they can only fire to about 20 miles, still you know it was a formidable weapon. And then you have the big seacoast mortar, you know, the 12 inch. And we have three types here in the harbor defense system. Like you have the the older 1890 12 inch sequels mortars, and on the right, top right, you have the 1908, and then the lower one, the 1912, which had the longer barrel, which actually had a better range than any of these uh, two mortars on top. So, this is a firing sequence of a 12 inch 1912 at Battery Craig Hill in uh, Caballo Island in Fort Hughes, shows the firing sequencing now. 
The interesting to note here is that when you fire the bigger, larger caliber guns, even the 12 gauge, you use like 270 or 320 pounds of live charge. Now for the mortars, you only need a maximum of 6 to 3 pounds. And the reason being is because gravity takes care of the rest. Because these mortars were not designed to fire directly, they were used to fire, I mean, a lobbing, a lobbing shot. So it's like a, a high angle shot. So, and what they use is mostly like deck piercing shells. And then you have the medium sequence gun batteries uh, in Corregidor in some of the islands here. On top, you see battery mortars are firing its uh, six inch guns, and on the bottom is battery Ramsey. Right? Some of the photos that you see here come from my personal collection. Right? So I'm sharing this you know, uh, here for, for everybody. You know. Thank you. But sometimes you read, like, oh, I mean, what is a six inch gun? You know, what, how does it look like? So, you know. Uh, to some of you, we have seen it, and to some of our audiences, I mean, this is how it looks. And then, of course, you have the 1917 and 1918 GPS. Now, it, what, what happened here was in Corregidor, they actually made what they call Panama mounts. I mean, it's a design used in the Panama Canal, wherein the guns will be allowed to be uh, in place on a semi fixed concrete. So, some of the Panama mounts, as you can see on the top photo, would either be 180 degrees, 270, or full 360 degrees. So it allows the gun to fire, and it has a deep uh, cut, so it allows the gun to elevate much further. Now, the interesting thing here on the bottom photo is a concrete uh, mount for battery west. The, the concrete actually we still found to this day. Of course, the, guns, the gun is not there anymore, but it shows the same gun mounted on the concrete. So the... the the ordnance and the coast artillery guys were actually testing a lot of of, of emplacements. You know how how they can maximize you know the, the the power and the range of their guns. And then you have the rapid fire DNC coast guns actually protects the searchlight batteries. Now, on the top photo you would see Philippine scouts. All right, these are not Philippine army guys. These are Philippine scouts, similar to what Rico and Albert was being telling you. And these are professional soldiers. Now these guys are so proficient in their craft, they could fire, they, they could fire around in two seconds. So imagine in a minute they, you know, you have a four gun battery, a two gun battery, this one. You, it's like a machine gun, you know, you have like boom, 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 boom. Mm. You know, and then of course the anti-aircraft guns, and uh, this is the model 1918, so it has a maximum range of 25,000 feet. And then you have a night firing practice using the M3. Now, you would see the notice that it would be 27 or 32,000 feet. Now, the range would, would depend on what type of fuses they would use in the ammunition. Usually, uh, they use the old powder train fuses and uh, actually only have a range between 25 to 27,000 feet. And then the U.S. Army actually came up with the new mechanical fuses, right? So they actually have a better proximity and range. And it allows the gun to fire to about 32,000 feet. Very, very crucial during the siege. Uh, I want to talk to you about just to give a description on the men who actually manned these guns. All right, so you've got four post artillery uh, regiments that were uh, in Puerto I mean, two of them were all the US, the 59th, which actually held the, sea, the big Seacoast guns, and then you have the 60th, which is a, the anti aircraft uh, regiment. And then you have two Philippine scout regiments, 91st and the 92nd. Now, a lot of these guys have been in service. For almost like 20 years when the seed started. Right. You can see by the book. And then you have the Beach Defense with Fort Marine Regiment with attached personnel from other units. So this is the, a, a typical scene on the parade grounds on top side. So at the back you'd see the mile long barracks and the 59th will be doing your drills. They do drills regularly and especially if they have envoys and special guests from Manila, you know, they, you know, they, they would conduct all of these drills. And then you would see here a gun battery and battery chaining. You would see the men, they, they're not young. They're actually more on their late 20s or their mid 30s. And, and the reason being is because, I mean, they, they, they hardly get new recruits because what they wanted is that these men should be like proficient. And you would see some of them are birdie guys. And, and the reason being is because they actually, you know, push and carry heavy stuff, you know, because all of these guns are, you know, are fired uh, in operating manual. And then here is a bunch of officers at Battery Smith, or Battery F. Right? Again, all of them posing in their 
Sunday dress uniform or type A uniform in front of their gun. Then you have photos of the 91st and the 92nd uh, uh, Coast Artillery, which are all Philippine scouts. Like what I said, a lot of these scouts have been in service for 15 to 20 years, and they don't mind having their promotions like delayed. So a scout would be a private first class for 10 years even before he gets, I mean, a private, and then before he gets to private first class. Right. If he reaches corporal, it will be a big fiesta in his hometown. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, for them, the service is actually, you are here to serve, and they're just happy to be in service. All right? Uh, so as you can see, the bottom photos, I mean, some of the scouts here are actually like close to middle age and you know, they love what they do. And that's actually at Carabao Island or at Patrick Cole. And, and, and do they love what they do out of a sense of patriotism or is it also because it's regular food, regular pay? Is, is there an economic situation in this when these guns are being set up that the people would like to have regular work? No, it's actually uh, mostly patriotism and okay. a little bit of course, you know. Uh, and you'll be surprised because when war broke out, some of the retired scouts went back to re-enlist. Right. And we want to fight. I mean, and, and they were officered by, by U.S. Uh, U.S. Uh, lieutenants and, you know, uh, and officers, but I mean, they were proud to be serving them. And even the officers, they said, I mean, the scouts are like second to none when you, when you, you know, serve, serve what you do. Right? So this is... Uh, it's a photo of the 90s, the battery G, I mean, uh, 92nd Philippine Scouts, manning those one, uh, one, 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 one. Now, this would be very, very vital during the siege because of the roving batteries. A lot of the scouts would have to be uh, conduct very effective counter battery fire against the Japanese during the siege. So, again, some snapshots of the 60th Coast Artillery Men. Again, if you can see, these are like, see, they're not veterans because they haven't been to war, but they're seasoned in terms of their. Yeah. So that's it. And of course, you know, it won't be found without the Marines. So you had the Marines here for beach defense. Um, and a lot of these photos were taken already during war. So a lot, uh, this would be uh, men from the Fort Mar uh, Marine Regiment. So, I mean, the winds of war. Uh, so even before the hostility started, what the harbor defenses did was that as early as May, they actually advised and then this happened actually to all the other army units, uh, U.S. army units. They actually advised most of their dependents to go abroad. Okay. So a lot of the families who actually live with the servicemen in Corregidor were actually told to leave. So by July, most of them have actually gone out of the island. And same with the Filipino civilians. Actually, they were all shipped out. And then what happened was Corregidor became into a semi-war footing. Okay. And although war hasn't been declared, but uh, General Moore has already given like discretionary uh, uh, orders to his uh, uh, to his uh, commanders, like uh, Colonel Bunker and General Chase, that you know uh, I, I leave it up to you to be ready in case war erupts. Right? So even the beloved prisoners, you know, have to be taken out of the island, except that. A few of them stayed until war time, you know, just to you know, just to finish off the trap. The last beloved prisoners got out of the island by December 11 of 1941 when war was already gone. So, and prior to the hostilities, they were already preparing. So what you see here is Malinta Hill, and that small hole there that you see would be the famous Malinta Tunnel. Yeah. Okay. Now Malinta Tunnel is very interesting. Uh, now. You, you know that in 1922, there was, a, there was a treaty called the Washington Naval Treaty, all right? And it forbade any fortifications outside the mainland U.S. and Hawaii, okay, for any American outpost. But the, but, but the Army wanted to have a storage facility in, in Malinta Hill. So what they did was they disguised this as a public works project, okay? Just to get around the Washington Treaty, saying, no, and the reason why they wanted it is because, oh, we needed to connect a road going to the, the tail of the island, which had also some, you know, living quarters and things like that. Because you had two roads that circumnavigate, I mean, the, the, the sides of the hill. But, you know, during rainy seasons, you know, and, and bad weather, those roads would actually, like, have landslides and collapse. So it justified them to have a Department of Public Works highway to, to enter, you know. So this is how actually Malinta looks like now. You know, Tonette was kind enough to give me a picture of his aerial shot here on the right. 
So in the insides of Malinta Panel, you know, this is actually a modern photo. And I think some of our viewers here who have been to the Philippines, you know, uh, would have visited this, this place. Yeah. Now, now uh, what you have to note is the entire Malinta Tunnel system uh, is actually elaborate. Right? So I, I've been there. I've, I've explored every lateral that can be explored. So uh, it has two entrances, the west entrance and the east entrance. The, the tunnel is actually 832 feet in length. And its side laterals were actually about an average of 160 feet by by 12 feet in in width and like 10 feet in height or something like that. Okay. Now, on the top part, we would see the Malinta Hospital Complex. Okay, so when these laterals were built, they decided to convert this into a hospital. So by by before the hostilities, they were already transferring all the medical equipment and whatever patients that were still sick into the northern side. Now the southern part, southern complex was the navy. It was still being dug when war erupted. So if you explore the place right now, you would see the tunnels but they were never lined in concrete, unlike the ones that you see in the main entrance. Now, I would like to point out some uh, very uh, 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 important laterals in, in uh, Malinta. You have lateral number one, because when war erupted, the Philippine government together with the USAFI headquarters and everything had to go to Corridor. So they gave lateral number one to President Manuel Quezon, who was the Commonwealth uh, President of the Philippines. Now, they gave him there because it had easy access to the northern uh, part, which is the hospital, because President Quezon at that time was uh, sick, was very sick. He had weak lungs, which actually uh, transformed into tuberculosis later on. Lateral number two was where the Harbor Defense Command, where Major General Moore had his office. Now, lateral number three was where Mac the USAFE and MacArthur held his office. And then you have lateral 12, which is the finance, and then in lateral nine, which is the... Uh, Harbor defense and anti aircraft uh, positions. Now, of course, you, you, you have seen these photos, okay? Now, yeah. Of course, there's a map, you know, with Sutherland in uh, lateral number three, and on the right, actually, is lateral number 12, which is the finance department. Now, Matt, when he went to Corridor, did it actually want to stay inside Malinta Park? Because he found it two crafts, like a beehive, you know, and Matt being Matt, he, he, he wanted somewhere else. So he went to General Moore, who was the Harbor defense coming and asked I mean, where is your quarters? I mean, it's on top side, just across the flagpole. So, okay, I'm going to take over there. I'm going to go there. So he moves, MacArthur moves his top, you know, and he actually planned to use the top side, uh, the mile long, uh, perhaps the top side as his office, you know. But what happened was during the bombing of uh, December 29th, actually, he was there on top side looking at, the, looking at the bombing itself. So, you know, the story goes that MacArthur was outside, you know, just watching the bombing being brave, and you have these two men, actually, and the guy on the left is Solomon Bayoneta, which is actually his guy, and another one is uh, Sergeant G.C. Palieto on, on, on the right. They actually told the general, and they had to have the general, sir, sir, you need to, we need to vacate the place, and, and these guys actually protected MacArthur, you know, during the bombings, and later on, he was convinced by, by all the other officers, sir, I think it's about time you go back. <laughs> No, but he did it at first. He actually stayed in another house just off the east entrance of Malinta Tunnel. But you know, in the end, uh, Gene MacArthur and his son Arthur were actually the friends of the So he had to choose. No, this is actually a photo of the east side, the eastern entrance that shows MacArthur and Mrs. MacArthur coming out. Now, on the eastern side, the officers' mess was actually. So they would actually have their meals, you know. And early part of the war, you know, when the Corridor was completed, bombarded that part. Now the officers still actually ate outside. And here's actually a photo of uh, uh, President Quezon together uh, with uh, Jean MacArthur and uh, her son Arthur and uh, Donia Aurora and uh, President Quezon's uh, daughter, Vicky. Of course, MacArthur and, uh, and Quezon, and it's actually where their relationship uh, Kind of went to topsy turvy because you no know, Keson said, Oh no, I want to declare independence and you and the Japanese just fight it on. But you know, and the photo below shows MacArthur with the high commissioner, uh, President Cyrus. So, again, like the mess quarters, you, these are some interesting photos. You see here General King, he was in Corridor, he is actually having his meal on the eastern entrance of uh, Malinta Palace, and on the right, you see here chatting with the Mrs. MacArthur and General Moore. 
So at that time, you know, uh, hostilities happened to the corridor uh, on, a, on a major scale. Some snapshots of the north uh, north lateral to show the hospital. So it's actually an elaborate hospital. You can perform any major surgeries uh, there. I mean, and you would even have artificial light, uh, artificial sunlight, you know, for, for any of the, of the patients who can't get out. Now, of course, you know, during the siege, you know, electricity will falter down, you know, the blowers would, uh, would shut down. So sometimes it would get so damp and it actually affected. It's a good time, good time to ask you a question about about power because it came up during your presentation about the gun batteries on Corregidor and on the islands. Because um, Keith Jones asked, did these islands all have underground self sufficient power plants? Yes, not not underground. Okay, they they would have some of the major structures would have like uh, for example, like Malinta would have powers for the blowers and you know something like. Uh, as much as the the power was supplied by the post uh, by the power plant, power plant machine, but uh, gun batteries, the Malinta, and you know some of the other major structures would have their own uh, uh, power supply. Okay. Because you know lines would be cut during the siege and then during the bombing. Okay. Thank you. Any other question that, that I'm sure is going to come up at some point? Um, Errol is asking about the fire control for the for the, for the various large gun batteries. Is it? Is it is, is there one central fire control point? I'm sure you're going to explain it at some point. Yeah, yeah I'm going to. Uh, okay, now, anyway, since the question is now, no, these, these guns, post artillery is actually like a science by itself. So, I mean, as much as you want to fire directly, but it's actually a triangular uh, base. So, you would have base and stations, you know, to, to actually spot ships because, like, I mean, I mean, these guns were designed to hit moving targets, not stationary targets. Yeah. So, what happens is you establish a baseline. And you would have fire control stations located, you know, uh, on, on a triangular basis. So, so some of these will be relocated or located in the other islands. So one one guy with an azimuth would spot a ship moving, and then the other guy in another base and would have another azimuth. They would all relay the information by telephone to the battery command station, and then the information would be sent to the plotting room. The plotting room would actually plot the movement, and they would send out the I mean the information to the gun battery. I mean range, how much how much powder charge you need to make because they would actually hit their targets like uh, with minimal error. First of all, they would fire a ranging shot, and once they get it, they readjust yep. you know the fire control, and they would fire again. So to the point that they would actually hit the waterline of the ships. So fire control with close artillery is really a science by itself, and a lot of these were done you know manually. There was no computers at that time. Mm. So, yeah, and it's interesting. I just want to reference what you said about the stocks of ammunition because firing thing, firing ranging shots can only be done if you've got enough ammunition. I mean, I I live in Normandy, where one of the big stories is is half the German Atlantic wall positions didn't have enough ammunition, even if they had fired, and some of them didn't fire anyway. They only have a limited amount of ammunition, and one of the big stories in Normandy is the lack of actual live firing the German gunners had done, whether they're Kriegsmarine guns or, or arm, army guns. They just haven't got enough ammo. So these guys are sitting there for two years, having never fired a gun, you know, all that time, almost. So th the system is only as sophisticated, can only be as sophisticated as how much you can practice it and how much you can, you can not waste ammunition, but when, 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 when an invasion comes, you you can you can have that ammunition to do ranging shots. So it's it the, the the science behind it must have a lot to do with the fact they know they've got that support in terms of shells. Yeah, uh, and I will explain like the shells later on. But to, to answer the question is, I mean, Corregidor never had a problem as far as ammunition, right. especially arti post artillery shells. They had a lot, and even in post war, there were a lot. And I'll show you pictures even in modern times. They still had ammunition, you know, uh, around the island. And like what I said, and the reason why they had like they doubled the supply of ammunition to the batteries because of the location of the Philippines against the mainland. So in case of war, and, and it did happen, they weren't able to resupply Corregidor with whatever ammunition for the big guns, you know, for the post artillery and medium sized guns. So that's why a lot of them have been stockpiled here in the in the Philippines part of the war as early as 19, 1925 and nineteen thirty eight. They actually sent a lot of the ammunition, you know, from, from the U.S. batteries to, to to the Philippines. Okay. So uh, I'll go to the shells uh, later on. Okay, thanks. All right. So now, uh, as the war 
began to progress, more men actually made it into Malinta, into the into the towns. Okay, so at first you would see officers in like a select number of men, but later on you would see you know a myriad of other men joining it. Now, on the left side you'd see the west entrance of of uh, Malinta Tunnel. That's actually there's an air raid going on, so you'd see people are being called inside. And the interesting thing to note is the guy on the left who was smoking. Because actually you see the sign near his head supposed to says no smoking. Because on the western side they still stored a little bit of ammunition, you know, you know, for, for defense, although a lot have been transferred to, to, to the battery. And on the right photo it shows actually the northern entrance of uh, Malinta Tunnel, which is on the hospital side. So you see here like there's a patient, you know, uh, getting a uh, uh, breath of fresh air, some men relaxing, had to smoke. And this is only done during the Laos during the siege, okay? Because, you know, when the Japanese would start firing the artillery and they would start bombing, everybody was you know, stuck. And at first, you know, the, the mess was located on the outside of the East entrance, but the, as the hostilities continued to progress, the kitchens were actually uh, sent inside. So here's actually the chow line here near the east entrance of uh, of uh, Malinta Hill, and you can see the men actually looking. You know, uh, the photographer was actually mounted, you know, uh, near the entrance on top, but the men were actually like trying to observe that maybe a new area. You know. So you'd see the chow line, and uh, on your right you would see some Filipino civilians still, you know, serving, you know, as as cooks uh, uh, during wartime. This is a wartime picture, actually. So you'd see the faces of the men. So what happened was, you know, the Battle of Bataan starts in January of 1942. I mean, after, after, after January 6. Okay. So the Japanese tried to outflank the Isaki defenders by sending in like uh, two battalions of, uh, of Japanese soldiers to the western portion of the town. What happens is, I mean. I mean First of all, Colonel Bunker was informed of the mission because the Bataan garrison was saying, oh, the Japanese were well entrenched in parts of Longos, Hawaii, and in Mount Kapoor. So that kind of actually excited Colonel Bunker because now, now is a time that we are able to retaliate. Okay? But it takes another 18 hours before he gets the green light to shoot. So, so by that time, it would have been midnight. So what he did was he instructed Battery Geary to fire uh, against the Japanese awaiting the go signal. Now, a lot of people don't know, and in, in a lot of the books, it only mentions battery three. But there are actually two more batteries involved during the firing, and these are actually batteries Greer in Carabao Island, which is 40 inch gun, and battery Hearn, that also fired against the Japanese in, in Longos Kawaii Point. So, what happened was on the night of the 26th, first of all, Geary fired a total of 12, 12 inch high explosive rounds okay, to, to Bataan and then Battery Greer fired 16, 14 inch shells, each shell weighing 1,660 pounds towards the Japanese at Longos Kawayan. So, you know, the Japanese actually were quite surprised when we were toward these big shells and we, they were exploding everywhere and that kind of drove some of the Japanese off the cliffs. Right. And this was followed by another shoot by Battery Hearn for another like 24 rounds, you know, here in it. So, this is actually, you know, uh, uh, like an eye opener, mm -hmm. saying that Corridor is not the only ones who are firing, but you see, like, the 14 inch guns at Greer, about nine miles away, firing towards uh, Bataan. Okay. As you can see on the top, it's a what? It's a pre war exercise, but you would see the, 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 the blast. And yeah. these are like shells, and, and the men in Corridor in, in Caballo Island would hear the shells. I mean, flying on top, and they would sound like freight trains. So, so imagine the magnitude of the fire. So, so after they, after the Americans actually, you know, uprooted the Japanese no more Hawaiian. Now, the the Japanese started amassing some artillery on the Kabiti side, and I was showing you, you know, what I mean at the back of the hills. So what happened was, you know, the Pondo detachment actually mounted. You know, two Type 96 howitzers, which is uh, 15 centimeters, and uh, the Type 92 105 long range guns. So, 
the interesting thing to note here is that the, the spotters of Fort Frank actually saw these guns when they were being mounted. So they asked permission actually to, before they get into Operation, why don't we do fire on the Japanese? And they did. So battery callers, 12 inch guns, fires 30 rounds to, and uh, uh, the 155 at Frank North fires about 36 rounds to the Japanese. And actually, the Japanese had to alter their position away from the area. Okay. But however, when they so but by you know by uh, the Japanese were able to mount these guns you know on a on more decorated position and they took I mean Fort Frank and you know and uh, Fort Dum on fire although uh, uh, I mean not much of big big caliber guns but actually long range and in fact the Type 92 actually hit some parts of Corridor it was mostly nuisance fire but it showed that the Japanese can actually, like, you know, we, we can fire at you, you know, even from the Korean side. So, like what they said, battery callers fires its 12-inch uh, mortars against land targets in Cavite. So, again, here you have uh, an example of another fort firing at the Japanese. So, like what they said, not just Corridor, but all the other islands. And if you notice, these are all manned by Filipinos, Philippine scouts. And they're proficient in their craft, like what I was uh, explaining. So they did hit the, the Japanese gun bag. So he, even the guns at Fort Hughes in Caballo Island joined the fray. So here you have the you know battery wood work in this fort in the firing towards the beating. You know, so any any armament that you can throw to the Japanese, you know, if you maximize it, even if it's a simple stuff. Mm. Now, I'm going to explain now the shells, all right? So part of the shells. Now, Corregidor has a lot of shells, but their shells are actually used, are made for hitting ships. So either these are deck piercing shells or armor piercing shells. What they lack was actually land projectile shells or high explosive shells. Now, the inventory by wartime is about 300 shells for the big uh, long range guns of high explosive plus another like 60 rounds for the mortars. So Bunker, Colonel Bunker had a problem is because now we're not firing against ship, we're gonna be firing against land targets. So what they did was they modified the the high I mean the armor piercing shells or the deck piercing shells because they do have a small charge inside, not as powerful as high explosive, but they do have a charge. What they did was to remove the delay pellet in the fuses. Okay. So upon impact because like an armor piercing shell is designed to puncture first and then uh, like do the damage inside of go a little bit. So by removing the 0.5 delay pellet of the shell actually made it in instantaneous when it hit land. So they have an improvised high explosive shell in, in that case. So other events that were, that were happening in Corridor. First of all, by earliest February 2, the U.S. is struck after delivering about 3,100 rounds of 3-inch uh, guns for the anti-aircraft. Actually picked up 2 tons of gold bars and 18 tons of silver coins from the form of the Treasury Board. So, I mean, it's, it's for safety measures, but the men in Corridor were starting to... It's like, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're actually preparing for the worst. So as early as February, they had, they had feelers already, because of all the promises of the... Oh, you know, my long ships are on their way for reinforcements and things like that. But uh -huh, why are we, why are we shipping out, you know, these things out of Corregidor? Right? Then on March 11, General MacArthur leaves Corregidor, <laughs> calls Skinny to he was who was in Bataan, uh, Skinny Wainwright, and tells him, okay, now you're like the most senior commander here in the Philippines. But he actually appoints Brigadier General B. D. as his deputy commander. So that. Actually, there was a confusion who actually ran the commander to himself. But mm -hmm. that's another topic later on. So, the uh, artist here, I think Tom, I think that means Tom something. Uh, he, he actually made a, it was a very decent painting. Some details are wrong. For example, like the docks are actually concrete in nature. All right. And in, when MacArthur left for the door, he had actually had three parties with him. So, they had about three or four uh, uh, PT boats. But only MacArthur got picked up in Corridor. The rest were actually were, were sent by launches to Bataan in Sisipan Cove. And the only time they got out for Hidor was when MacArthur left for Hidor and all the other people. 
so yeah, and 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 there he he bids us goodbye to Wade White, but tells General Morphy to pack by. He escapes for his door. Now another another part of Kurdibor that is actually interesting and it's not much talked about is Station Task or Station C. This is actually the Navy intercept tunnel. This was built, you know, in, in Kurdibor. The Army guys do with the Navy, but the civilians after all are all forbidden to be Navy staff. So on March 15, the actual well the tunnel was actually a listening post for the Japanese diplomatic and military forces. So they have a listening post here. But the but the high command said that okay, these guys are so important they shouldn't be captured. So on, on the 15th of March, you know, the US permit evacuates 37, 36 of the cryptologists and linguists uh, with them. So because they cannot be afforded to fall to the Japanese for in case. Now, same time as the guys were being evacuated, I have power detachment. Hayakawa Detachment is composed under under confirmed Masayoshi Hayakawa of the first heavy artillery. It was the first heavy and the second independent heavy. Actually, artillery regiment went to Cavite. So imagine landing in Lingayan as far north and dropping them all to Cavite. Third traffic. They started to increase in their plans. Right? So these were armed with Eight Type 45, 24, 140 millimeter howitzers, and two Type 96, one of the rare guns in the Japanese arsenal. There were only about six fates of the Type 96 to 40, but two of them made it into the Philippines. And, and that goes to show that the Japanese were actually serious you know, in, in, in trying to reduce the fortifications. What happens then is on March 15, okay, 7 30 in the morning, no, and the reason why the Japanese would like to fire during the morning is because they would have the suns in their back. Right. And it would be harder for the for the for the gunners or the spotters from the Yusaki side or the post to spot them because of the glaring sun. So at 7 30 a.m., the higher power detachment actually unleashes a tremendous barrage. All right. They they plaster Fort Trump, I mean Fort Frank with 400 shells. And a hundred shells at Fort Trump. You know, the fire was so intense, you know, that the men in, in, in Carabao Island had to stay in their uh, underground for a long time. Some of the some of the batteries were hit, okay, like uh, two of the 155s at Battery North were actually destroyed. Its anti aircraft position destroyed. And what happened was in Fort Drum, I mean, even if they're shelling it, the, the crews were protected, but they were like being pounded to inside the drum. Now, this is a modern photo I took. Now, you can see there on, this, on the yellow circle, one of the 240 millimeter hits at Fort Trump. And you can actually see the radiance of the explosion because on your left would be Cavite. And you would see that, so every 240 shell that would hit Fort Trump would chip away about five to nine inches of concrete. Now, wow. the, the guys inside there would be safe because it's 20 feet of concrete on the top. But imagine the, the barrage would actually be the, 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 the insides of the fort. You know, some of the shells actually hit the turret, and one of them, I think it was in Battery Marshall, had a crack, which actually they, they repaired later on. So no casualties in drum, everybody was safe inside, but all the blowers would be off, you know, and they would just actually sit it out uh, during the pump. So there, there was an act, so the Hayakawa detachment keeps on firing for about a week. Uh, I mean, plastering mostly for Frank and for Trump. Now, one incident happened was that on the, I think on the last day, just before you know, uh, the Hayakawa ceased firing, is that on the 21st, uh, some guys in Fort, in, in Fort Frank were actually having their yellow fever shots because it was a lot. But the Japanese actually had their, their hands in their lanyard. So upon seeing the opportunity, they fired a Fort Trump. And then, while, while the, the men were lining up near the infirmary by the entrance of one of the tunnels, a 240 millimeter shell exploded. And it actually, like, 28 guys were killed outright. And another 46 were wounded. And this is the spot. This is a modern photo I took in Fort Frank that actually shows the area where the 240 shell hit. 
So imagine the lip of the tunnel is actually operated with it right now. Mm. You can see the part of the concrete. And one interesting thing I found out was on the right, you'd see an actual an actual graffiti or an actual uh, artwork in the walls. That's actually war time. And it's still mm. preserved, although some of the guys that actually that you know, because right now uh, Fort Frank is being used as a C2B training by the Philippine Marines, so sometimes access here would be limited. And some of them actually vandalize the photo, but I was telling you, the Marines they're home. don't vandalize it because that's an actual oh, World War II art yeah. by the wall. So, so it's very interesting. So the Hayakawa detachment leaves, you know, because the Bataan campaign was being intensified. But what the air but now it's the turn of the Army Air Force, you know, to, to conduct some raids in the door. So they actually had, uh, I mean, uh, they actually uh, knew what targets to hit. However, anti-aircraft uh, fire in Corridor was very effective. And then I was able to meet one Japanese officer, I mean, uh, you know, uh, who survived the war, who was able to leave their group. And he actually gave me you know, an idea with a sketch. And these are actually the arrows that you see here are actually the routes that the Japanese Air Force had to take because they would try to avoid as much you know anti-aircraft fire from, from the defensive corridor. Okay. So and, and it actually highlights, and this is very interesting, where the Japanese were coming from, from the captured airfields. Like Nielsen, you have Clark, you have Deep of Steel, you have Nagilian as far as north. And you would see the sketch actually of uh of, of the corridor and where the gun the AA batteries were and this is where you know uh, an interesting uh, piecemeal there was that so you have the machine guns and the anti-aircraft guns but you had a gap somewhere between 10,000 to about 15,000 feet I mean lower I mean 7,000 to about 15,000 feet now some of them cannot be hit by machine guns so what they did was there was a spare 1.1 inch uh, you know uh, quad from the Navy it actually came to the USS Houston when it refitted. So this was in Cavite. Later on, it was sent to Mariveles and Bataan, but it made its way to Corridor. The Navy turned it over to the Army with 25,000 rounds of ammunition. It was placed on top of the hill. So it was called the Chicago Organ, you know, that was his pet name. But the, the men here in, in the Philippines called it the Pong Pong because of its up Pong Pong. Mm. So they called it the Pong Pong. So the photo here on the lower right shows the, the actual gun that was uh, destroyed. You know, it was manned by Lieutenant Stanley Friedland on top. So how they operated this is they had to get a costly motor, I mean an automobile uh, motor, uh, for them to operate the gun, and they would have a water pump from a pump pump to actually cool because it's water cool. Okay. So this actually solved the problem of the middle, in the middle part of the uh, or the dead spot. Uh, during the siege. So, and, and the reason why I'm showing this photo, this is actually a Japanese KI-21 Sally bomber that was hit by a three-inch shell over, uh, by a three-inch shell over Corridor. That wow. actually killed the, the gunner at the back. And despite the damage, it limped its way back to, to, to Park Airfield. And the Japanese did acknowledge, you know, after the war was that, I mean, during the first part of the 41-42 campaign, the hottest reception they ever got as far as anti-aircraft is concerned, was in the harbor of Fort Frank. So what happens is now, the Japanese moved their gun closer. Okay. So what happens was in Bataan, you know, uh, the Japanese launched their final offensive of April 3, and they actually rolled through the defenses. Okay. And as the situation, you know, uh, got weak in Bataan, some of the men actually were starting to evacuate some of the some of the AA units was stationed in the mainland were actually being asked to move to Corridor. However, on the night of the eighth, through the request of the Bataan garrison to General King, they needed to have an interdiction fire. So they asked General Moore for for batteries Hearn and Battery Smith, right, to fire against you know uh, uh, roads in intersection. Okay, just to delay the Japanese because everybody was moving down the peninsula and yeah. everybody was being trapped. So anything that they could do. So what happened was uh Hearn and Smith fired starting at around six PM on the eighth, all the way to about five ten in the morning of the ninth. 
each of them fired 34 rounds each of high explosive uh, you know shells uh, against the Japanese who were also going down the road it didn't stop the Japanese totally but it actually hampered uh, the movements of the Japanese because I mean some of the men had to be you know evacuated you know to the shore and just to just for enough time for them for the men in Bataan to have to pick themselves. So after five o'clock in the morning, these two guns fell silent. And they were never fired again toward the entire siege. And there's a reason for that is because when the Japanese controlled Bataan, they had bird's eye view of all the guns to and these two and these two guns were actually are like bullseye because of the right. circular amount. They're easily spotted from from, from the gun. Right. So we go now to the actual you know shooting. I call it the rain of steel or the last roar of force artillery. So as, as the Japanese captured Bataan, their guns are actually closer now to Corregidor. So this actually shows you the Japanese you know positions in Bataan and they can take Corregidor easily. Some of them will be in defilated positions, you know, and they actually had a good spot right now to, to lay, you know, a, a siege in, in the entire island. So what happens is, you know, first of all, uh, when Bataan surrendered on the night, okay, the Japanese, you know, uh, there was Japanese light artillery unit that actually tried to shoot back at Corridor. They were so eager to fight Corridor because he could only see, it's like, it's like two and a half, three, three miles away. So let's take a shot. So what happens was, is that when they fired, you know, some guns in Corridor, those 155s actually destroyed the, the Japanese battery. But Wainwright actually forbade them to shoot because all the prisoners were being called Maribeles, all right, for fear of hitting, you know, uh, the POWs. Mm. And some of the gunners in, in the batteries in Corridor with their with their with their lenses, you know, powerful lenses, actually saw that the men were being called and you know they were being captured by the Japanese. And they felt helpless. They said, you know, we cannot shoot back, but we might forbid such. However, on the twelfth of April, when they saw that all the prisoners were out out of the Maribelas in the Kapkabi area, you know, uh, Wayne White authorized a counter battery fire. So again, battery Geary, as seen here, it start, starts to work on the Japanese. They fire at Lukanin point, so they hit several you know, ammunition dumps and even a tank part. But the Japanese, you know, I mean, uh, they were ready and they shoot back. So on top, that's Battery Morrison, you know, manned by the Philippine scouts. Now, the interesting story about this one, the Battery Morrison only had the life of four hours because the Japanese actually plastered the entire battery destroy the battery command station. Now what happens was the same crew moves to battery grubs. Now battery grubs had a better life. They had a life of course. But it was also like hit by the Japanese. Below is battery Kaisor. Okay. So that's a pre-war photo, but it actually had three one five five guns were actually shooting back to the Japanese. So by this time April twelve actually marks the day, which coincidentally is the the the, the shootout. You know be, between the Japanese and the gunners and the so you know just to give an idea so a, an entire fire coordination was was made so you see battery really somewhat for drum battery chain is disappearing gun Geary, and they fire a lot of shells towards the back okay so they, they were not afraid to shoot now you, you would sense that even though they fired 56 you know shells but these are pinpointed targets and these shells mm -hmm. actually blew up you know so, I mean, I, I have the entire tabulation of all the firings, but I'm just showing you what a typical day yeah. would, would be like. Okay. So, by April 18, Hayakawa's men, okay, uh, and, his, and his big powerful house moved closer. They were used during the Battle of Pataan, but because these are cumbersome, they started actually moving closer. This is, this is actually came from a graph from a polarized field that shows them actually mounting the two for those uh, 24 centimeter or 240 house. So what happens was uh, at April 18, Hayakawa's monsters, together with all the other long-range guns, the Japanese started firing against. 
start clustering for you. This is another plot. Now the Japanese would like to, to hide the guns in that area. On top you'd be, would be the 10.5 Type 92 long range guns and below is actually the Type 89 15 centimeter gun on the treaty, which is actually a very, very powerful gun uh, 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 with the Japanese army. So Hayakawa's, Hayakawa's monsters and all the other artists start plastering for the door. So one interesting gun battery in the island is battery Monha. Monha means monk. Now, it had a two-gun battery, but gun number one is interesting because it's in a concrete casemate. So it's actually more protected. So it, 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 it did drop about 40 or 50 shells against the Japanese uh, artillery positions in, in Pataan. It's gun number two on the right is on a deck, or was in a cut. Mm. Actually, the, the one just could get exposed and the, the gun would destroy. But Monha, as you can see in the two left photos, was actually firing and it was protected you know, from, from uh, Japanese gunfire. So the effect of Ayakawa's, uh, of Ayakawa's monster. Now this is a photograph of battery cracked, one of the 12 inch guns. As you can see here, those 240 monsters actually lock shells here. It punctures the recuperator, uh, uh, the housing of the recuperator. As you can see the hole, uh, you know, by the middle of the gun, you know, that, that metal with that rivets. And it actually breaks off the elevating arm, rendering this gun useless already. So, what happened was later on, uh, they activated first of all the roving battery. Now, the roving battery would be like 155 guns dismounted from the semi fixed concrete. What they would do is that it would be commanded by the officers who, and they were named after the officers who commanded them. So, what they would do as during the lock, they would get out of their position by tractor, and then they would fire the Japanese and head back to their shelters. So the Japanese would have no idea, you know, where, where, where the guns were, where, where, where were coming from, because you know the, the Japanese were so used and fixed to the point that a lot of the concrete guns were are all fixed. So they have a predetermined, you know, location to fire. But the roving, the roving battery becomes a, a, a well. Uh, uh, a, a, a well a, a well piece for counter battery and it was all man man by the scout. Japanese had a hard time like pinpointing where they were. And then on April 28th, now battery way is reactivated. Now it's been in caretaker status since the 30s. And the reason being why is because the, the battery way was one of the older gun batteries uh, constructed in the door. But in when the post hospital was built, the Port Post Hospital, it was just like about 300 meters away. So imagine during uh, I mean, live fire practice, when the battery would fire, it would actually shake the hospital, and some of the smaller bottles, you know, medicine bottles, you know, tray would fall off. So that's why the battery was uh, uh, rendered, you know, in, in uh, caretaker status. And also, like, uh, there was not enough crew uh, to man it. However, a unit from Bataan. The 60th uh, uh, Battery E of 60th Post Artillery, you know, uh, 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 went back to Pohidor and its uh, commander, Phil Marcello, Major Marcello, actually asked permission from General Moore. Hey, can can we go to Battery Way and have it activated? Because we want to we wanna shoot back to Bataan. To, uh, so it fires on April 28th, which came to the surprise of the Japanese because this, this, gun, this gun battery has been, has been silent. I mean, also up. So together with him and Geary, they actually fired a lot of shells towards the Japanese in Bataan. I mean, out of battery fire. And the mortar pits are actually in uh, in, in dug up positions, and it cannot be hit by direct fire from the Japanese. So that's why the mortar, I mean, the, the howitzers of the Japanese will play an important part. Now, something catastrophic happened on May 2nd. Right? So, on this day, no, first of all, I'd like to show the illustration. It's a good illustration, some errors. I mean, it shows actually the blast of hitting a Japanese shell hitting the central magazine of that. Mm. But later analysis here point out that this is actually what happened. So, as you can see, for the Japanese angle, that, that arrow that points to the central magazine is actually where the angle of the 240 shot happened. So it penetrated not the top because on top you have another like 10 feet of solid work. Right. So it actually hit the weakened right wall of the magazine. All right. When it when it punctured the mag 
magazine it set off anywhere between 17 to 20 tons of powder charge which actually blew the entire battery out of commission now the on your left you would see some arrows the mortar two mortars actually went to the walls of the side magazine mortar number one you see that red arrow to your left actually flew to the road on the right one which is pit b which is the only mortar battery in operation because pit b has already been you know uh, out of commission due to damage one mortar remains in its place the other one flew on top of the parapet the other one went on top of the parapet but later rolled down so this is a japanese photo of the destruction of battery fuel you know, as when they took over the island. On the top photo, you can see the central magazine dock, and all remains is a crater. Mm. You would see the, you would see the mortar there is actually the one holding the the roofing of the left traverse magazine. On the right top photo, you would see one of the mortars. You know, mortar number one stayed in the same position. And the photo below, you would see mortar number one, but in mortar number two on top of the parapet that mortar rolls down post war and if you visit the place right now that mortar is still loaded to this day wow it is all right so the joke there of us visiting the oh I, i'm looking down the barrel and the this go up and you know say no it's all for all day it's just day. again it's still loaded to this day so if you happen to chance for your door visit that mortar take a picture so going back, you see this yellow circle because we tried to account for all the mortars, you know, in our exploration. And we couldn't account what that mortar is actually a mystery. So the legend goes, oh, it flew off the sea, it was all for that we scrapped it. But a good friend of mine did some extrapolation and some extrapolation. And in our part, we went through the jungles. So imagine a 14-ton mortar being thrown 80 feet in the air, landing a mother like 300 feet in the battery near the jungles, and being in the same spot more than 80 years. So that's me actually when we did we discovered the mortar. So it all now accounts for what happened with the destruction of the battery. So these are modern photos of UAE said so you would see on the top right. The big hole still left after the explosion of the magazine. Oh yeah. Left, you'd see one of the mortars actually holding the roof of the concrete. And like a couple of shells are still inside. Actually, I mean I've been scattered inside. I mean on, on, inside. So what happens is after the destruction of Weary, you know, when, when it blew up, it actually shook the entire island. The Japanese actually stopped stopped by they said, oh my God, I need to destroy something. You know, of course, they were cheering. But by the, on the 3rd of May and all the way to the 5th, the Japanese start uh, shifting their fire. Of course, they still flashed their top side, and then they started shifting their fire towards the ship. So what you see here in these photos are two, I mean, Japanese type 89, uh, 15, 16, 15 guns in decorated positions in Patahan. So they were on the fire. And then, the, and then the defenders in the island actually are, are starting to sense that something was about to happen. I mean, the Japanese were really intensifying the fire. And on Bataan, the Japanese were already doing their preparations. The photo there on top you see is uh, the men from the 61st Infantry Regiment, uh, commanded by General Sato. And, and these men are actually, you know, preparation. You would see some of them carrying extra parts of their ammunition, extra food, some of them have broken hands. And on the top left of the photo, you would see some bamboo. They're actually bladders. And uh, the interesting thing about this photo is that the men you see here, 70% of them, are junior. So some of them are being put in their last photo. And these are Japanese already in Cap Cap in the Mao already like uh, preparing for war. And then on the night of the 
take the Japanese king. So during the invasion itself, so some locators actually picked up the sound of barges after the town, Tang Kompatahan. That alerted all the major caliber guns that can bear on the invasion. So at night when the Japanese tried to land in the island, so every gun that can still bear fired, you know, capsized a number of Japanese barges. Okay. And it caused a lot of casualties. So only a few of the men, there were actually two waves. The first wave, which actually landed there on top, see the Japanese landing. And I have a good photo here, aerial photo by Tonet. Uh, show. Now, this is actually the map. Showed the Japanese men. So they land at North Point. So despite casualties, they actually start mounting and start going up the North Shore Road and they start going near Battery Denver and uh, hit the uh, exit. Now, on your right, the second wave actually hit the land because the tides actually were so, so strong, they got swept to East Point. And in East Point, there was actually uh, a bunch of about 86 men. I mean, commanded by Lieutenant Lawrence. Okay, so Lieutenant Lawrence, his his position was not exposed to the Japanese. He had two 75 millimeter field guns, two 37 millimeter field guns, a bunch of machine guns. He had about 3,000 hand grenades, all right, and about 25 parafrat bombs. You know, I mean, 25 pound parafrat bombs. So, and he had the searchlight. So. When he saw that the Japanese were actually coming to his area, he hit the searchlight. But up, up, upon lighting the searchlight, the Japanese were just about 200 yards away. The Japanese machine gun, you know, the, the searchlight. But it was enough to illuminate where the Japanese were. And then he let it out. He's 75 guns, he's 37, but firing the Japanese. There was carnage. Right? So the aftermath carnage was that 22 barges were actually seen floating, several hundreds of the Japanese bodies. And then some of the barges, like, they would have a capacity of 60 men. And those 60 men were all dead inside those barges. So imagine the volume of fire. So Lawrence fires about 1,300, 1,000 rounds of 75 millimeter ammunition. He fires 1,637 millimeter ammunition. He pumps in 4,000 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition and 17,000 rounds of 30 caliber ammunition. He expends all his 3,000 grenades and 25 parapet bombs. A friend of mine right now in Japan has actually translated a diary of a survivor in, in the invasion. And in fact, oh. the diary writes is that he, he survived by hiding to the rocks, called all of his way to, to North Point, but in the water he actually that's how the carnage was. However, this, despite uh, Lieutenant Lawrence's you know, uh, violent effort, the Japanese did push through, and the third wave actually landed tanks in Corregidor. And they landed two Type 97 Shinhoto tanks of the Dutch Volkari, and then they also landed a captured M3 Stewart tank. And what happens in the invasion was that the two Japanese tanks bogged down. They had to take the M3 to hold them up, you know, from the beach. So the tanks that actually saw action in Corridor was the M3 uh, commanded by Lieutenant Ho. So Lieutenant Ho actually, you know, participates in the, the fight on the eastern side uh, of, of uh, Tail. So what happens is he, he, he knocks out the machine gun position and then the report of tanks that landed actually uh, sent uh, shivers to the spine of Wainwright. Imagine he, he, he was thinking, what if a Japanese tank is able to penetrate, pass through, enter Malinta Tunnel, and shoot in the lab? Mm. That actually was one of the reasons why he said, okay, send an emissary to start negotiating at least. So while, while the fighting was still ongoing by the tail, a battery wave with its one last remaining mortar was still firing against the Japanese. They were firing to the tail. Now, Major Marcelo, pictured here on top, who was already wounded, was actually instructing his men on the stretcher to keep on firing. Okay. And then the photo down below is Sergeant Walter Kuczynski. I, I met the son who actually lived in Kuzo for a while. 
he was actually the one putting the lanyard of the last water. So, I mean, battery way was firing from the evening of the 5th all the way to the morning of the 6th. And by 10.30 a.m. during a lull, you know, after a 30-minute lull, the breach of the motor, you know, after it got so heated up, it expanded and froze. So they couldn't fire the motor anymore after that point. So that was the last time, you know, a seacoast gun in Corregidor or in any part of the island would ever fire. Right. So, so by that time, they were given the order so to execute Pontiac, which actually gave the order to destroy all major caliber guns except for 45 uh, caliber uh, pistols used by officers. And then by 11 o'clock, uh, Wayne Wright sends uh, emissaries, and by 12, the white flag goes all around the island, meaning that he's about to surrender. Going on to the quick people to surrender now. Now, what happens is General Wayne Wright is sent to Bataan okay, to, 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 to meet with Oma. And in the meeting, was that uh, Oma was actually demanding him surrender of the entire Philippines. And Wayne Wright goes, No, I'm, I'm only authorized to surrender the harbor. Oma dispels that because the Japanese know that Wainwright is the highest ranking commander in the Philippines at that time. So Oma actually, I mean, uh, pushes Wainwright aside. No. And he goes like, I didn't meet General King in Bataan because he was lower than me. And why should I meet up with you? I only meet with, you know, negotiate with uh, a person in own rank. So at first, you know, um, Wainwright, you know, doesn't want to surrender because like, uh, we still had forces down south. We had Major General Sharp's uh, forces in Mindanao. But, but Homa said, okay, if you don't surrender, hostilities will continue. Okay, so that actually got Wainwright again. So he was in a dilemma. So whether he would like, keep on insisting that he surrender just the harbor of Port of Bay or surrender in fact. But in the end, he acceded. And, and actually, Homa said, so Homa actually had, he played, he played this card by saying, he, Homa goes to him, oh, you already denied that authority by claiming you can only surrender Corridor and all the other islands. So what do I do? Well, you can go back to Corridor if you want. Now, if you want to surrender you know, the entire Philippines, you do it as a Japanese commander in, in Corridor. So mm -hmm. when gets shipped back to Corridor, meets with Colonel Sato, and, you know, and surrenders the harbor forts unconditionally. Then on the following night, on, on the 7th, he was taken to Manila and the quote on the right is in the famous Wayne White Rogers book, yep. surrendering the Philippines. Right. So so what happens was, you know, the Japanese entered you know, Manila Tan. So interesting in it. And they tried to get the prisoners out. And they were giving the I mean all, all the men inside only 10 minutes to vacate. And the Americans started saying, oh, you, 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 you can't evacuate because there's close to what six thousand men inside and a thousand Patients in, in the North Lackers, and then some negotiations, uh, you know, okay, okay, but, uh, you know, uh, we are we going to inspect everything. So, the two photos that you see here, the, the left photo is propaganda shot of the men at the west entrance of the of Manitaban. Photo on the right shows actually. Mm. You know, now, the other interesting thing to note here is that after this photo was taken, all the men on the western side were pushed back inside the tunnel. Because they had to exit to the east, because they had to go to the 92nd garage when they were, when they were all going to be interned. So that's what happens. And, and then the Japanese take advantage of you know propaganda, saying that, oh, we, we treat our prisoners well. So this is the photo you know, of, of men inside the Malinta. And it shows actually you know, parts of the thousand bed you know, hospitals in, in, in the triple bed area. They tried to take photos of the nurses. And in fairness, none of the nurses were treated well. They were not molested by the Japanese, but the, the Japanese photographer was saying, at least take a picture of smile. Who, 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 who wants to smile? We just, we just surrendered and, you know, that's why the nurses hmm. So, uh, now this is an interesting photo. It shows Barrio San Jose destroyed. And this is actually our, an occupation photo that the Japanese. Now, Malinta on the left, the west entrance of Malinta was destroyed by the photo. But you would see there, a lot of men, they were actually, you know, the guys who surrendered. 
And on the right, you see the four port, one of the three of the four portals of the navy tunnel system. So you, you don't only have two entrances, you, you also have the navy entrance. You have a north, south, but four other portals. And then on your lower right, you see the remains of the marketplace. And that's where actually General Wayne was surrendered to the Portuguese, to the Japanese. So again, more, more propaganda shots. So you would see there, they will have the man post on top of Malibu. Again, that's a 75 millimeter gunship. Yep. It's actually, a number of them would be on top of Malibu. Again, and he still would score with uh, you know, some of them till today. On the right here, you, you, you would notice that the Japanese were actually milling around with the POWs and they were not taking And one account mentions is that, you know, despite what we hear about the Japanese, the, the ones who actually went to the door were actually nice to some of the prisoners. You know, they were even allowed to go in and out to get supplies and food because the Japanese didn't have anything to feed them. So might as well, like, uh, take what they have. And, uh, this is a Japanese photo of General Wayward's quarters in Natural Tech. So again, the Japanese tried to make this in a propaganda or shabby uh, uh, living place of American commander in the future. So again, I I'd like to point you to out that not all structures during the first battle of the Philippines were destroyed. And for example, like you see here in the side bars, it's completely intact. And the reason being is because the Japanese spared a lot of the structures. It's because of their limitation as far as ammunition. So the Japanese would fire most of their guns towards pinpointed targets, military targets. And the reason being is because they had to track all their supplies from Lingay and Gold, from Lingay mm. and Lingay in Beach. Because Manila hadn't fallen during that time. So imagine they had to, to supply their army fighting in Bataan and Corregidor. And that's 138 miles away. Yeah. That's why the ammunition expended, you know, was really mostly for military targets to destroy as much military targets and, you know, take the. Uh, uh, of course, you know, they also saw that, you know, you could still be using this property. In fact, they revived the Fort Mills Hospital one wing because a lot of people from Bataan and the doctors were actually billeted in, in this hospital. So see, I mean, that's the uh, shot of the ordinance uh, shot, and then on the left would be the trolley barn. So the, the railway system of Corregidor was totally damaged. You can see, you can see a bunch of Japanese monkey cars. Now, this one I was saying about, so the prisoners were all called to the 92nd Gerwat, which is a beach, a former seaplane base. You would see there on the photo, those black pictures actually take hands. So a lot of the enlisted men that were captured in both Corregidor and Caballo Area or Port Hughes were sent to Corregidor. Now, the ones that were captured in Port Brown and Port Frank had a better reception. They were sent to Wawa, which was a dock in Batangas. And, and the reason being for that is one of the Japanese officers lost a brother during the fight against the Harbor. So he actually took notice on the prisoners coming from Port Drum and Port Frank. So he sent them to Wawa. The photo on the top right, you see they confiscated all their headgear and axes. Mm. And then, see, in the lower photo, you'd see them being given the sun treatment. And that happened for about two or three days. They weren't given food for water, or water. So a stark contrast from the ones who were captured in Borrido and Caballo as compared to the ones that were captured in Drum in Cargo Island. So you see the thing. You would see on the top left photos those barges or like the Japanese power sometimes in barges. They used to transport the prisoners from both Frank and Drum. Wow, wow. So again the Japanese used Corridor as a propaganda place. So famous for Bansai photo at uh, at Factory Hearn. It, it, it gets circulated worldwide. And then General Homa actually inspects uh, the door. He goes visits and visits Battery Wave because he says that, you know, this is one, one battery that, that actually gave me nightmares. So the interesting person down below is Her Majesty uh, Prince Morihiro Higashikuni. 
and he was a Japanese royal. Now he was with the first heavy artillery regiment. And his his big monsters, those two forties actually were the ones that plastered both Geary and, and Way, right? Way. Now you can see he's he's looking down the barrel of a modern war. You would see the dent in the barrel and you would see on the modern day photo we just took that dent is still there. Yeah, it's still there. It's still there. So it's nice to compare like oh this guy was standing here so so this this motor was when they used this motor. and of course you know japanese went around the island you know when they took the pom-poms on top of malinta you see the japanese posing holding the, the ammo japanese officers with maps at that is me you know. and then more shots okay and this is an interesting battery you know i just couldn't find the photo but they actually did another battery here battery. So the Japanese actually sent a, a technical team to evaluate the, the harbor defenses. And then a landing party goes to Fort Drum. Uh, you would see here that the Americans have sanitized the 14 inch gun. You would see the crack on the barrel line. Mm. So it made, it made them you know, useless in case the Japanese were trying to put them back into action and you know, use it against the Americans for, you know, during the taking. On the left is General Morioka of the 16th Division, you know, inspecting the top deck. And on the right is Colonel Lewis Kirkpatrick, who was the CEO of Fort Trump. Here, is he, here he is, you know, escorting ja a Japanese technical team. And he was actually explaining to, to the Japanese, you know, uh, you know, support, you know, how they play, how they play, all that stuff. And so more captured Japanese photos. This one is actually in battery to SP. And, and, and some of these actually don't make the Western publications until recently. And, and some of them are actually still, you know, and below is actually a, a shot of that you put up another photo. And then interesting thing is Carabao Island. You see that they captured the battery almost intact. You would see yeah. on the top of the photo shells and on the right side, uh, in the right and behind the Japanese were actually powder shots. So you could imagine when battery theory blew up, the arrangement was similar to this. So now the powder charges were not in camps, as a, a lot of men do. They're actually just in the battery itself. So when theory blew up, it actually set up the, the powder charges. Japanese are going up the rail line, and battery caller actually captured most of the time on the left. You know, these four mortars, or eight mortars, two damage charges. This one at pit B actually was most of the time. And then on the right is uh, one of the 14 inch guns. I think this is in battery. Okay. So now what, what the Japanese did was during the occupation, they made it into a recreational facility. So you see here Japanese having their photos taken. Now, interesting to note here the Japanese on the right has its own camera. But when the Americans surrendered, before they surrendered the island, they actually made reports that they destroyed or unlocked the breaches and destroyed them. But the photo shows otherwise. If you can see here on the right, the bridge map is almost intact. So it's still technically still usable, you know, um, from, from, from a military standpoint. And these photos were taken about late 42 or early 43. Now the Japanese on the left shows one of the mortars on Barry Geary already on the docks, meaning that the Japanese had other plans. Now, the, the Japanese retained a few of the POWs in Toledo. And they were used actually to move stuff around, you know, scrap, scrap things. And um, despite, you know, being, being there, they were actually treated and fed well by the Japanese. So they stayed there for quite a while. And the Japanese, as early as that, they were, were doing a lot of scrapping activities for the war effort. So any guns that are, or any metal or steel that they can, can get in the Philippines, they had to transport it back to Japan. And, and actually, uh, this interesting photo here on the left. This was taken in 1945. That shows one of the 12-inch mortars of battery, you know, theory, you know, on the docks of the Pasig River, awaiting for transport back to, to Japan. So I mean, it goes to show that the Japanese war effort they needed all the materials that they can they can get in scrap. You know. Mm -hmm. So I end with this slide, and and, and meaning because. It symbolizes as well that not only did the Japanese did scrapping because you know, post-war, you know, a lot of the guns and positions in, in the 
all four defenses of Manila Bay have also been scrapped. Mm. So what exactly is going on? All right. So that actually ends my my talk, and I'm, I'm off time now. Well, it's been absolutely brilliant. I mean, we, we, I think you've been answering most of the questions as we go along, but I'm just going to, the, the one I'm going to do, then we'll bring things, it's from Peter O'Connell. So, so it's back to Wainwright. He's saying, was there an epiphany where Wainwright tumbled to the fact that Corregidor was done for, or did the possibility of relief evacuation still exist? So, so that the moment when Wainwright realizes surrender is the option. Yeah. I mean, let's put it this way. I mean, if the senior officers in both Corregidor and Bataan knew that the jig was up, it's only a matter of time. Because when 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 Roosevelt was also promising to them that supplies were coming in, reinforcements, you know, seven mile long ship convoys on their way to the Philippines, but as we all know, the, the Navy was destroyed for her. There were no ships actually. There, there was resupply to the Philippines, you know, made by effort submarines and cruisers, but they all actually went to Java or Spell. Submarines actually made some big but in, in the minds of the officers, they knew that reinforcement wouldn't arrive quickly. And with the war situation going on, uh, not only Wainwright, but all the other officers knew that the jig was going to be up, and it's only a matter of time. So it, it, it weighed a lot on Wainwright. So Wainwright's you know, philosophy at that time was to save as many men as he can, you know, uh, rather than, you know, fight it out to the end. Because MacArthur gave his strict order, you won't surrender, you have to fight it out to the end. But, you know, I, mean, the, I mean, for humanitarian reasons, we might have to consider these things, you know, he had 15,000 men in, in the harbor defenses in Manila Bay, and, Plus another, let's say, you know, all the forces outside. And then the Japanese actually, like what I was saying was that they actually kept the corridor and the harbor defenses prisoners as hostages until such time that all the other uh, units in the archipelago surrendered. Mm. So imagine that. So even though he surrendered corridor already, he was still in the present that the Japanese have, have still. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, no, no relief on site. Well, we will end things there, Tony. You will get an invite to come back in October when we do our second Philippines week. In the meantime, you go and get yourself a beer. You've been talking for a long time. It's been fantastic. We've learned a lot. People have been amazed by the photos, amazed by your knowledge. So I will invite you back again. So, folks, this is Paul Widow for World War II TV saying I will see you all again after my break when we come back with various naval shows. Trent Hone is on. Stan Fisher is on. And it's been fantastic hosting this Philippines week. So thank you, Tony, Ronnie, Albert, Ricardo, uh, and... Um, uh, Mark and John for these brilliant presentations. Folks, thanks for your questions. I will see you all next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.